Hey, welcome back. Uh, let's pick up from where we stopped. So uh, we completed the covenant with Abraham, the blood covenant with Abraham. Now let's move on, uh, page 15 on your notes. The blood covenant with Moses and Israel. OK, now during the time of Moses, God did quite a few things. Number one, he gave the law to the people of Israel, right? the Mosaic law. Uh, the Ten Commandments and then the laws, uh, additional laws were uh, created. The tabernacle was set in place. Mosaic priesthood was set in place, meaning the, the high priest, the uh, uh, Levites and all of that was set in place. And there were feasts instituted. So if you look at the book of Leviticus, you'll see seven main feasts. And these feasts were important. They had meaning. They all pointed to the Messiah, to Jesus. And as Jews, they were, you know, those who believed in God were supposed to and must follow these feasts. And, and we also see it in the New Testament up to Jesus' time. Right now, let's look at those seven feasts. The feast of the Passover, feast of the unleavened bread, which is speaking of cleansing and removing away of sin. Feast of the first fruits, which is speaking of our new life in Christ. Feast of the Pentecost, speaking of the power of the Spirit. Feast of the trumpet, speaking of victory and triumph. The day of atonement, uh, speaking of Christ's atoning work on the cross. The feast of tabernacles, so speaking of our pilgrimage in this world. And, and, and so now remember this. When God gave these feasts to the people of Israel, to Moses, they didn't know it's pointing to the Messiah. And they would have done it because God told them to do it. right? And Moses told them the way to do it. But now when we study the scriptures, we are able to understand, OK, this was because this is what it means. right? Now, during that time, the Israelites may not have understood. It's certain you know, uh, feasts. I have to do it this way, and this is how it pleases God, right? But one important one, uh, one important covenant was the covenant of the Passover, because this was a blood covenant. Now all of us know what happened, right? God sent Moses, said, "Go, I'll bring the people out of Egypt." Many miracles happened, but at the last one, since the Pharaoh was not willing to let the people go, the last one had to be shedding of blood right now what happened god made a covenant with the people he said those who want to live those who want to come out of the promised land you take a ram kill it take the blood of that lamb and apply it on your dopos what's going to happen book of exodus says that death will pass by death will come those whose homes did not have the blood, death will go in and they will die. But those dopos which has the blood, death will pass on. Now, this is a blood covenant that God established. Okay. Now, let's see what, what kind of covenant that is. God gave Moses the law and established it with the blood covenant. Now, now we know that you know the Passover is referring to Jesus, that through his blood, uh, we will not die, but we will live, right? Uh, and again, in the book of the covenant and the blood of the covenant, when God gave Moses the law in Exodus 24, God gave Moses and he said, OK, explain this laws to all the people of Israel. After he did that, look at verse 7 and 8, Exodus 24, 7 and 8. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Then what did Moses do? Verse 8. And Moses took the blood. Now, this could be the blood of the lamb or the goat. He took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So we see two places where there was shedding of blood. One was in when they were in Egypt, 
God said, cut the ram, put the blood on the doorpost. Death will pass by. Then when they came out of the promised land, they were in the desert, in the wilderness, walking. And God says, okay, I'm establishing a covenant with you now. This covenant is, these are the laws. If you obey them, it's good for you. If you disobey them, that's going to bring curses upon you. And what does Moses do? The people say, yeah, we will obey everything what you have said, we will obey. So Moses took blood and he sprinkled it on them saying, this is a blood covenant God is making. Right? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the rituals, the priesthood were terms of the covenant. And Moses and then the Aaronic priesthood became the mediators of the covenant, meaning the covenant was established by God. He made the blood covenant and God told Moses, listen, Moses, you are a mediator of the covenant and also choose Abraham, sorry, uh, Aaron, your elder brother, make him the high priest. So he became the first high priest. Now I'm sure Aaron will be wondering, what should I do as a high priest? Right? But over time he would have learned, right? Okay, we're going to do it this way. You've got to, as a high priest, these are things you must do. You must perform all the offerings, all the sacrifices, uh, make sure that everything's happening well. Now, remember, they were carrying the tabernacle. It was There was no temple. They were moving from one place to another. So he had to make sure things were right. Certain rules, regulations, rules and responsibilities that the high priest had. But Deuteronomy 28 is powerful because, you know, when he writes there and he says, the entire chapter is powerful. God is reminding the people and he's saying, see, I've already told you, when you follow the law, I made a covenant. If you follow everything I say, blessings will come on you. Remember, we, we looked at Deuteronomy 28, right, last class. But if you disobey, blessings and curses will follow. Right? Then the old covenant established with blood, Exodus 24, 1 through 8. Now he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor stand, nor shall the people go up with Moses. So Moses came. And they told the people all the words the Lord, words of the Lord and the judgment and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has uh, which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord as he rose up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountains and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. He then sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Same thing. He's establishing the covenant. right? Look at the sacrifices. Um, the sacrifices and feasts were invoking or proclaiming the covenant. right? All the sacrifices, all the feasts. Uh, if we do a study of, uh, we can't go in depth into the study of the covenants, uh, meaning each covenant. But if you read Leviticus, right, uh, and you see all those offerings, all of them are talking, pointing to Jesus, establishing the covenant. These are the ways that you must do things. And this is how I will establish my covenant with you, right? Uh, salt of the covenant, oh, that's, a, uh, that's again a very powerful aspect that was used in the old covenant. Salt, blood, words. These are all powerful aspects of covenant. And then we look at the blood covenant with a new creation. Right? Uh, Matthew 26, 28, Jesus says, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. So our, our, our offering of spiritual sacrifices is a way of invoking into the covenant. When you and I partake of the Lord's table, what are we doing? We're opening our lives for all the blessings of the cross, the blessings of the new covenant to come into our lives. That's what we are doing.
That's why when we partake in the Lord's day, we're saying, let let his resurrection power, his his blessings, his his glory fill our hearts. Right? Healing, deliverance, everything that is there on the cross is available for us when we partake in the Lord's table. Right? So what is the first covenant? With Abraham, he sealed it, right? With blood. Then with Moses, he put the blood on the lamp of the on the doorpost. And then again, uh, when he made the law or the feasts and the laws, God told uh, Moses, go sacrifice, take the blood, and sprinkle it on the people. Right? And then the blood covenant, which is for the new creation as believers, what Jesus did on the cross. Right? So these are some of the blood covenants uh, that God has established. So which is the most powerful blood covenant? Which one? Jesus? Why? Human blood? OK. OK, human blood, but I'm looking for the right. Why, uh, it's, it's human blood, but what was he? As, as God, he came into this world. It is, it is blood that is holy. Now, in the old covenant, they caught a lamb without blemish. He cut, they cut it, they took it, they went, you know, the high priest would take the blood on the day of atonement, pour it on the altar. That is just that means that is a good ram. I've given the best blood to God. Now God has to establish the covenant, so God has to give the best blood. And he sent his own son. So when there is the blood of Jesus, should I go back to the old covenants? Is it applicable for us now? Should I take blood and put it on the doorposts? When God makes a covenant with us, should we cut an animal and walk between it? We don't need to do all that. Why? Jesus has already done it. Now, this covenant is far greater than that of the old. The book of Hebrews, he talks about it. When Jesus died, he we'll, when we talk about the cross, we'll also look at the aspects of what the cross did. But when Jesus died, he took his own blood as a sacrifice. Right? Perfect sinless, pure blood. Not the blood of rams and bulls and goats and all of that. His own blood shed on the altar. It's an everlasting covenant. What about this Passover? Every year you have to do. What about the other sacrifices? Every year we have to do. But the book of Hebrews says, once and for all, he did it for us. So the greatest covenant is the covenant that the Lord Jesus made on the cross. You and I are people of the covenant, chapter 4. When we look at the old covenant, we see how it affected people in their daily life. How did being in covenant affect their life every day? And, and, and let's look at a few aspects of how it affected them in their everyday lives and how you and I, being part of the covenant, uh, how will it affect us? Uh, our lives in our daily walk with God, right? So there were people of the covenant of God and covenant, and God had promised to work with them and through them in a special way. Exodus 19 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Exodus 34, 10, and he said, Behold, I make a covenant with you before all your people. I do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all people among you, um, among whom you are, shall seek the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. And in Acts 3, we see Peter's reflection, and he says, 325, You are the sons of the prophets. And the covenants which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed, all the families shall be blessed. What's something important that we notice here? God is a God who makes a distinction. When you're in covenant with him, 
he makes a dis distinction. Everyone knows what's distinction, right? He makes a difference. There's a dif difference between when you're in a covenant, when you're not in a covenant. Okay? So look at our own lives. When we were not in covenant, what was important to us? When we didn't believe in Jesus, what was important to us? The things of the world, right? Okay, all of you were born believers. What are the things that were important to us when we were unbelievers? Friends, bad habits, bad words, it's all will come out on its own. But the moment we become believers, there's a distinction. Right? I remember uh, the, the moment, uh, you know, I, I became a believer and for many months I didn't meet anybody. I just was in my room. But after about six months, I decided to meet some of my old friends. And I went and met them. They said, hey, Paul, you're so different. Now, in six months, I didn't put on weight. I probably would have lost weight. right? But they said, you're so different. Something is different. I, I had the same dressing sense. Probably wore the same clothes what I wore six months back. Same bike, same, everything is the same. Nothing has changed. But they said you look different. Why? Because when you're when you're not in relationship with God, and when you're in relationship with God, there is a difference. And God draws this distinction. He tells the people of Israel also: when you are in covenant with me, walk in covenant with me, I will bless you. Your livestock, your children, your families. I will give you things that you didn't even think about. I'll take you to the promised land. I will, I will bless you. I will. You, you will have your own vineyards. The book of Jeremiah talks about it. Right? You will have your own fields in your own vineyards. You will eat the fruit of your labor. You will be blessed when you go in. When you come out, everything you do will be blessed. But if you are not in covenant with me. Then there will be curses. I will not bless. I will not. I cannot bless when you are worshiping another god. When you are following other gods, I cannot bless you. But my covenant is: I will bless you only when you obey. When you are when you are in the covenant, you are receiving from the covenant. It will automatically come on you. Why did the people of Israel take? 40 years to reach the promised land. Was God angry? Was God thinking, okay, let me play a game with them? Was God ever thinking that way? No. There was a reason. It's hardly a journey. Hardly a journey. It's nothing much. But you know what they were doing? They were circling one mountain. Oh, I've seen this place before. That's all they were doing. There's Mount Seir, they're going around that mountain. Round and round and round. Grumble, okay, go one more round. Grumbling again, go one more round. There is the promised land. No, you go one more round. Then new generation, when Joshua came, God said, okay, I promised Abraham, I'm going to take you to the promised land. I made a covenant with Abraham. You fellows are not listening. You are still disobedient. You are still doing what you want. But because of Abraham, I have to take you to the promised land. Okay, Joshua, get ready. They are going to enter the promised land. Right? So it's not God's fault that, that they were going around in circles there for 40 years. They would have reached much earlier. The problem is they were not walking in covenant. They were doing everything, but they were not in covenant. They were worshipping other gods. They're saying, oh, if I was in Egypt, you know, there it was better. They didn't have foresight. They didn't look at, hey, so covenant God is made. God is saying, I'll take you to my own land, a land which will be filled with, you know, uh, milk and honey. What a wonderful land that will be. What do these people want? They want to reach there immediately. Doesn't work that way. Right? The moment you're in covenant, God draws a distinction. Even now, as believers, right? 
God draws a distinction between us. He calls us. He says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. Outside, you may be somebody very simple, you know, living in a small town in India, but you are a chosen generation. When God looks at you, there's a distinction. I was reading this recently was 25 years of Graham Stains uh, and his two children, two boys who was burnt alive in the Jeep. I think it was re uh, probably last week. I was reading it and my heart just sank. Just thinking how, how it would have been, you know, they came to India and to serve our nation. He had all, you know, why would he leave the United States, come here, and these people, Indians, are going on. Why should he do all of this? Have you ever thought of it? He gave up everything, brought his wife, brought his children, and they were martyred here. But God draws a distinction. After all of that, many, many lives were touched. There's a distinction. God, God knows who his children are. Yes, the scripture says in Isaiah, I know you and I call you by name, for you are mine. Right? Exodus 9, 26. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. You know, here's interesting. In the, in the book of Exodus, when all those problems came about, you know, all the livestock and these grasshoppers and all these plagues that came. Nothing happened to the people of Israel. Look at Exodus 9, 4. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Think of this. You've got livestock of Egypt. You've got the livestock of Israel. No, the livestock of uh, uh, you know Egypt. Everyone, all the everyone are dying. The goat is simply dying. The calf is dying. The the you know the mothers are not able to give birth. There's no blessings there. But the same place they are in. But the people of Israel is multiplication. Why? God has made a distinction. Right. Again, in Le uh, Exodus 11 also, the same thing happened. Uh, and so all across uh, in Exodus, even now, God makes a difference, makes a distinction. He calls us as a special people. He says he will overtake us with blessings. Right? He, look at those, some of those blessings there in page 19. Deliverance, protection, healing, prosperity, blessings. Victory over our enemies. He will overtake us. Deuteronomy 28, we read that, right? Uh, blessed you shall be in the city, the fruit of your womb. Everything you do will be blessed. But if you don't obey, none of these blessings will come upon you. As covenant people, we live in community with one another. Right? To live in community means to care for each other, to care for the poor, to care for the orphan, the widowed. Uh, and, and when you look at uh, the old covenant, God cared for them, right? Uh, he had specific instructions on how to eat, how to uh, live, how to observe feasts. And there were certain customs that they had to follow. You know, God went into detail. How many of you have read Leviticus? You should read Leviticus and Numbers. You should read it, right? You no, know, Numbers is a lot of numbers, but there's a lot of nice nuggets of information that you can get right because you know in 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 celebrity case god has chosen the high priest and he also tells the uh, moses and aaron how the high priest should stand what they should wear the high priest so they should wear this kind of a robe they should have 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of israel everything in detail did God say, okay, you do what you, this is what it is, you do it like this? No. Right. In Leviticus, he says about the offerings, he said, when you, when you cut certain animals, don't remove the blood. Then he goes on here and he says, for this offering, you remove the blood. This offering, you remove the fat. Another offering, you keep the fat. 
Now, when you kill it, you go outside far away, kill it, then bring the blood, or then on all kinds of you know instructions. Why did God do that? Because He knew that you know when we are in covenant, He expects us to follow these laws. Now, thankfully, we don't have to believe in all of that. All we have to do is believe in the cross, believe in what Jesus said. And Jesus said, he finished the work on the cross. It is finished when Jesus paid the price. And he says, all our sins are forgiven. When Jesus said he resurrected from the dead, he will come again. When we believe in all that, we don't have to do any work. We just know that we are in part of his kingdom. Right? Look at the shepherd who killed the warrior David. David believed in his covenant keeping God. Right? First Samuel 17, 45 to 46. Then David said to the Philistine, that is Goliath, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of armies of Israel, whom you've defied. Look at David. He's not saying you're defying. You're coming against me. He's saying you're defying the army of God. So now I am standing on behalf of the nation of Israel. On behalf of the army of God, I am standing. right? And he's saying, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth. And all the and that all of the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Perfect example of holding on to a covenant. What does is, what is David say? Hey, you're not coming against me. Who are you coming against? You're coming against the God of Israel. So you are saying, Goliath was saying, what happened? Where's your God now? Nobody's coming forward. No? Everyone are mocking the God of Israel. But David comes and says, hey, you're trying to mock the God of Israel. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut off your head, number one. And then I'm going to make the carcasses of all the Philistine camps food for the birds of the air. How old is David? Maybe 13 or 14 years old. Young boy. Or maybe 17, somewhere around there. Young boy looking at this man and saying, what is he standing on? He's saying, you're coming against the God of Israel. The God of Israel is a covenant-making God. So he's with me. So there's no Goliath that I cannot defeat. You come, you come with five of your brothers, I will defeat all of you. Because I'm coming through a covenant name. See how you, the moment you understand you're in covenant, the way you look at battles, the way you look at your enemies changes. They may be big and strong, but when you're coming in covenant, that doesn't matter because God is bigger. Right? And then he says, with your descendants, Isaiah 59, 59 and 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants, descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forever. My covenant will not depart from your mouth, from the mouth of your descendants, or from the mouth of your descendants, descendants, I'm going on and on. My covenant shall be there, right? It is my covenant with all of them. Then let's look at what happens when we violate the covenant. What is the meaning of violate? Violate means to break, right? Signal is red. But nobody is going. What do you do? What do you do? Nobody is there. Signal is red, but. It'll go off, no? No, don't do that. <laughs> See, some of you are Greek. 
If it's red, it's red. The moment you go, whether people are there or not there, you got to wait. Why? Because that's the rule. You're, you're violating the rule. You can be fined for it. But there's no police. But cameras are there. Right? But nobody is watching. God is watching. Right? So a rule, where, when you violate a command, a, a, a covenant, what happens? We suffer defeat. We suffer captivity. Look at Leviticus 26, verse 14. If you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, and or if you if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, I will. I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror upon over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and sorrow, and cause sorrow of the heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. When you and I break the covenant, God is dead. this is God. Same God who said in Deuteronomy 28, I will bless you, the fruit of your womb, you will multiply. Same God is saying, if you disobey, what's going to happen? I will also do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you. I will appoint terror upon you. That means what? Now, for example, as believers, we are walking, we're doing everything, and now I decide to do something wrong, right? Something that is totally against God. What will happen? What am I doing? I'm breaking the covenant. I'm breaking the covenant which God made with me. He said, you know, through the blood of Jesus, I'm called his son. And as a son, I need to be obedient to the father. I cannot live in sin. So, so for example, you take a believer, he's living a good life. But all of a sudden, he, you know, falls into sin. Right? What's happened? He's broken the covenant. He has violated the covenant. Now, God is still gracious. He doesn't bring hail and fire upon us. He's still gracious in all our mistakes. Yet, the consequences is something that we have to face. Right? If I do something wrong, I have to face the consequences. Right? God may forgive. We may go back and ask for forgiveness. But the consequences I have to face. Why? Because I have violated the commandment. Imagine I, I have broken I've, the, and the traffic signal. I broke the law. I've, on a red signal, I've gone. And the police comes and stops me. I cannot say I'm a pastor. See, I'm a pastor. I actually preach about uh, obedience. So now I'm going for hospital visit. Somebody is in the ICU. I have to go and pray for him. That's why I broke the signal. They'll make you stand for more time. It's better to agree that you did wrong and move on. Pay the fine and move. The moment you start explaining, I'm a pastor. You know, I believe in Bible. This is what the Ten Commandments is. I know everything. They said, then why are you not applying it? Yes or no? It's the same thing. When when I cannot say anything and just move on. I have to pay the fine, then move on. Same way, when I violate God's commandments, God God is still merciful, but I have to pay for the for the things that I've done wrong. Yet in that God is so gracious. Right? He you know the Lord Jesus will help us to overcome our mistakes and help us in our in those challenges that's the grace of god something that we don't deserve yes if you read the old testament no it's only god's grace and mercy that's all it is imagine god did these wonderful miracles brought the people out of egypt but they are not bothered to believe in god six months they're believing in another god Three months they believe in another God. Harvest time they're believing in God of Israel. Why? Because God of Israel only will bless our land. Ah, the blessings have come. Okay. Now another six months they're doing something else. Three months there. 
three months here. No, all over the place. Now God is saying, hey, I'm a zealous God. That's I am the what is the commandments? There is no other God apart from me. But still, you people, if you read first Kings, Second Kings, what's happening? God is sending these prophets. All the Israelites are following other gods. What about the God of Israel? Nobody wants. Elijah comes, oh, he, he stopped the heavens from raining. He goes, okay, please pray to your God that it starts raining. Now they want rain. Now they want the God of Israel to do it for them. So if you read it, if I was God, I would have waited another 10 years. But God is gracious, right? So it's not an angry God in the Old Testament. It is a God. It's because we haven't kept our side of the covenant. These things happen when we violate the covenant. But look at Jesus who ministered, yet he was, even though he was under the old covenant, in, in he says in, to the daughter of Abraham, uh, through, though healing and deliverance was not for, was stated only for those in God's covenant. Uh, but look at this, you know, the daughter, God says, you as a covenant with Abraham, do you think you should not be healed? And God heals this woman. The children's bread. Oh, this is another. Uh, I forget the verse of this. A anybody can pull up that? Uh, the children's bread? In, uh, probably in Matthew. But if you pull it up, just let me know. I'll keep going. Right? Then Jesus said, I will make a new covenant with you. Jeremiah 31. 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers, but he goes on to explain. Verse 34, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, say, saying, know the Lord, for they, shall, they all shall know me. For from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So, an everlasting new covenant. The Lord Jesus established a new covenant for us. And this everlasting covenant is, an, uh, is a covenant of peace. It's a covenant that can, no other covenant can replace this covenant. You and I are part of this new covenant. So I want to encourage us. When, as believers, remember, your, when you are in covenant with God, you do your best to keep your part of the covenant. Will there be failures? Yes. But go back to God. Remember that you are part of a covenant. God is faithful to keep his side. Right? He shed his blood. The price is paid. He has called us as new covenant people. He has called us his children. We walk in that identity. Right, and then we, when we walk in that, we will receive and see the blessings of God in our life. Amen. Right. So we'll stop here, and next week we'll pick up from the new covenant. What is the new covenant all about? Right. Uh, and we've been talking about you know Abraham, Moses, the two blood covenants, but in the new covenant through the Lord Jesus, what is the blessings available in this covenant, the new covenant. So we'll pick up this from next class. Right? Everything okay? Everyone able to understand? Right? So even as we finish this, we, we'll get into um, the cross. Uh, we'll get into the cross. We'll talk about the power of the cross. And then we'll talk about the blood of Jesus and how the blood of Jesus, so powerful, still talks about it. Yes, Pastor, you, you were referring to Matthew 15. Okay, yes, Matthew 15, 26 to 28. Yes. Uh, can somebody read that? Uh, Matthew 15, 26 to 28. Matthew chapter 15, verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Verse 27. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said to her, 
as you desire and her daughter was healed from that very hour okay this picture is see the previous one was a daughter of abraham jesus says as a covenant with abraham healing is your is yours it is part of it so jesus heals her but in this this woman is a gentile she is not part of the covenant okay and she goes to jesus and says you know this is the problem can you please heal this is what i'm going through what does jesus reply he says it's not good to take pearls and throw them to the pigs or it's not good to feed the bread to you know it's it's not good for me to do this basically what jesus is trying to say is they are not part of the covenant you are a gentile but in response to that the woman said but at least the food the bread that falls from the table you know what what does it say there in verse uh, uh, sorry 28 can you repeat 28 uh, it's 27 yeah 27 28 and she said yes lord Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Even the dogs, that means even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus was in awe of that answer. Wow. You will receive your healing. But she was not even part of the covenant. Right. So what does it say to us? Even you know, when you go on, when we see uh, after that, you know, God begins to work among the Gentiles. And we talk about that in the New Covenant. No more is it about one place, one tribe of people, but the entire world, the entire, every tribe, every language, every tongue will confess the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's what we'll see in the New Covenant. Right? Okay, let's stop. We'll pick up from next week. Have a great weekend. See you next week. God bless.